So as we start our second panel, we're very lucky to have with us uh, Heather Zeichel. And uh, Heather, uh, I think the, the president said it best, and so I'm just going to quote him. He said, we can't have an energy strategy for the last century that traps us in the past. We need an energy strategy for the 21st century that develops every source of American-made energy. And I think Heather is really the person at the White House that coordinates uh, energy strategy uh, for the president and for the administration. And uh, we're thankful to have her uh, here to moderate this session. Uh, Heather? Great. Uh, thank you, and thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'm joined, obviously, by a very accomplished panel that, uh, as somebody who thinks about renewable energy every day and who spends a lot of time thinking about what the administration can be doing to help create jobs and to continue to see the increase um, in our domestic renewable energy production. Um, I'm very, very lucky to be here today. Um, I want to start um, off with, a, I, I think, a question just to, to throw at everybody, um, and I think it will be very informative. Uh, why did you decide to work in renewable energy? I'm not sure, uh, I'm Eric Ingersoll, and, and I do want to thank uh, the, the people who organized this, and, and I also just want to make it clear that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm here representing a huge team of people, people on my board, people in my company who, who, are, who are a big part of what, what we're doing here. And um, I think personally, I, I'm not sure that it was a conscious decision. I think that as you, uh, but, but I, was, I was raised to, to be honest about what the problems were in the world and to, to feel like uh, it's part of my life's work to solve those problems. And uh, as I think if you're honest when you look out at the problems in the world, one of the biggest things that jumps out is, is that ener the way we use energy today is a huge problem. It's, it's a huge problem because of the negative effects that are created by it, but it's also a huge problem because we need so much more of it to create a, a world where um, the standard of living, where, where you know, the other four billion people uh, that are on the planet with us can, can approach our standard of living. And to do that, they're going to need to double or quadruple energy consumption on the planet. So uh, any way you cut it, it's a very big problem. And uh, I've just found myself increasingly drawn to that. The more I understood about it, the more of a problem I saw that it was. But also, as I began to pay attention to the technologies, um, the technology side of this, I began to realize that we had energy everywhere around us. There's energy coming from the sun every day. There's energy in the wind. There's energy in the oceans. Um, there's energy in, in terms of plants. There's even uh, energy in the form of, of using energy better. And, uh, so that as I became more and more aware of those technological possibilities, uh, the, the need to sort of connect the solutions to the problems just became something that, that basically I became obsessed with that. And, uh, um, and that's really what led to the formation of my company, General Compression. Thank you, Heather. Um, and thank you as well to everyone for this very humbling opportunity to be with this incredible group of people. It's, it's quite an opportunity. I, I, similar, I, I think renewable energy found me. It wasn't really a, a conscious choice for myself either. In my early career, I was a nurse in maternal child health and working quite happily and then uh, joined the company that my husband found, NRG Systems, uh, about five years in um, while we were raising a family and trying to figure out how to balance everything and there was a need in a growing company to join him. And, and I did it as a, as a a, a new venture and, and to enter into a growing business and to figure out business, really not thinking too much about wind energy and, and where it all fit. And in, and in the early days, um, this is back in the early 80s when there really wasn't much of a wind energy uh, industry, and it was all about technology, all about how to make the better wind turbine, you know, where the blade's going to be fiberglass or, or wood, and, and, it, and it wasn't that interesting to me because I'm not an engineer. but. In the early 90s, that started to change. You know, as as uh, wind projects started to be completed, 
um, the conversation started changing from the, what's the right technology more to where does wind energy fit in and what does this mean for our society and our, for, for our world. And it started getting way more interesting to me when you think about what it means for a community to have a wind project and what it means for our energy policy and our future and environment and the health of, of, of just our, our world. And, and I got hooked. Um, so here we are 30 years later, I'm, the, I'm now the CEO of the company, and it, it's, it's, it's my life, it's my passion, and I can't imagine anything else. So it, it, I think it really chose me and, and got me. <laughs> I want to first say again, thank you. Uh, it's a great honor to be up here and a uh, great uh, opportunity to get the word out on renewables and uh, what brought me what I think is the, the exciting innovation that's happening in this, this business and the fact that it is a real sustainable business model. Uh, when I look at, at hydro, which is what Voith represents, we do hydro equipment, 66% uh, of the renewables in this country are produced with hydro. And there's a lot of excitement left in the hydro business and when we look at the economics of the model, this really makes sense. So hydro produces renewable uh, power that is, uh, it's, it'll compete with any, any other source out there and at the same time it's clean, it's uh, reliable, and it's good for our country. So I guess it's those last three things, it's clean, renewable, good for the country, it's the right place to be. Um, first, I just want to say thank you to the White House and to those who nominated um, Limited Energy Solar Solutions for us to be up here. It's very humbling and um, we truly appreciate it. And, you know, I am so glad to know and hear my colleagues say the same thing in regards to that it found them because it really took me back when I was, saw the question and I heard it and I was saying, well, how am I going to explain about how I ended up into this um, renewable en energy region because I am actually from a business background and um, actually the founder um, of Unlimited Energy, Mr. Tommy Lee Nellen, who's actually in the audience today, if you wouldn't mind standing up so I can acknowledge you, he found me, okay? And so many times we always talk about the history of a company and the founder is usually gone and passed on. So it's a privilege to be able to talk about him and, and talk about the renewable energy and what it's doing. But one of the things he came to me one day and he said, you know, Ms. Kreese, we need to take it to another level. Renewable energy is, is here. Um, I've been in it for many years, but we need to take it to uh, training. We need to be advocates for the industry because it's not going away. And I took on that helm and I took on that passion and now it's ingrained in my blood. So not only I'm looking at it from a business perspective, but I'm looking at it from a consistency perspective in terms of what can we do to make it better. Renewable energy is something that's going to be here today. It's not going anywhere. And um, I'm just glad to be a part of it. Um, it is, is something that we all need to embrace. I am very honored to be amongst everyone here. Um, I thank the environmental entrepreneurs specifically for nominating me to be here. And it is an honor to be part of President Obama's Winning the Future initiative. Because after all, we're all here not only for our children and our future, but for future generations to look back and say, this is a generation that, that actually made a difference. We changed perhaps a fossil fuel-based economy to expanding our portfolio of opportunities to a clean energy economy. And that's why I'm here. I think because I really am worried about my children's future. I'm an um, advocate of looking at how can we create a resilient economy. And our economy right now has seen uh, busts and booms. What kind of energies can we create where we're going to have fixed energy costs? and? What's one of the biggest areas where I could perhaps make an impact for a resilient economy? Well, I looked at several business models, and one of the things I looked at were sustainable transportation methods. How do we move forward? Because that's such a big chunk of where our fuel 
is headed. And so I looked at all the parking lots. We have about 3,500 square miles of parking spaces in the United States alone. That's a lot of heat as well that hits. So now how do I think about where am I going to go with that? Well, I looked at some incredible technologies. The costs are coming down. And it's solar carports. Solar carports cost now has come to a point where I can dispense and I can have a consumer drive up their car, fill it up with sunshine, or get power from the grid, which increasingly, as we all know, is renewably ener renewable energy produced. Now they've just filled up their car for about probably 60% less today. Uh, like they get a 60% coupon every time they fill up their car because they're not using fossil fuels. So here we are with a highly sustainable transportation fuel source, but also my solution at Zem Energy will put energy into a nearby facility. And I have a second company that we are inventing ways for energy efficiencies to create small microgrids that will look at demands on a facility and perhaps even future-proof fleets in ways that are going to is assume cost, total cost of ownership over time that will increase the ability for everyone to drive sustainable transportation. Now, oh, the fly likes me. <laughs> I just got attacked by a fly. That's a good sign, I think. So I am excited about where we're headed um, with the clean energy economy. Uh, there's communities that want clean energy companies like myself to succeed. Um, I'm coming from Colorado. Colorado right now has a clean energy economy that is increased at six, a six and a half percent clip for the last five years. That has been an extremely beneficial thing because we are a more resilient economy here in Colorado. And I'm seeing that we have um, are one of the few states that are starting to reach out and look at a more sustainable form of uh, fuels that we can grow our economy with. And next year, I, we expect just from September to April 12th, we looked at about 2,000 new jobs were created in Colorado as a result of the clean energy economy. So my goal was to work locally, but it's um, quickly, we have found that financing this has been easy. We are making money for everybody involved, and we are now spreading this across the nation in a vision that um, we have quite a large pi pipeline, so we're very excited to be part of this. Great, thank you. Um, obviously, as I, we were listening to the answers, there's a lot of talk about future generations, both from a making sure our planet is in a better place for future generations, but also from the perspective of, of the workforce. And I guess I have a question for you, uh, Ms. Kreese. How can we think more strategically about what we can do to train and recruit young people to work in the renewable energy sector? Um, for me, it starts from young youth, starts from zero. Um, I'm passionate and adamant about um, really trying to reach out to uh, not only the elementary schools, the secondary schools, but making sure that there is an integration of um, communication, or should I say curriculum, related to renewable energy. Um, that's the only way that we know um, as the end user, when I say end user, the employer, um, we're going to be getting and receiving uh, trained um, staff. Um, we need to make sure that uh, the young youth um, are, are feeling comfortable with renewable energy from the early stages. And we can only do that by making sure that um, these items, such as when I say items, I should say renewable energy um, perspectives, renewable energy understanding uh, terminologies are ingrained in the t curriculums from an early, early age. Um, it's very important. Um, I know that our organization over the last couple of years 
Um, we know that we have been in the industry for many years. And we said, how are we going to now begin to pass that baton on? So we have internally um, created our own grant program, and we are now collaborating with educational institutions. And we're going out, and we are uh, giving our, our time. We're donating products, um, as well as monetary, if necessary, to make sure that the schools are doing what they need to do in collaboration and in, in, in um, uh, relationship with us so that we can make sure that we are being of um, any assistance that we possibly can. Thank you. Another, just going back to the introductory remarks, another key theme that we heard was the connection between challenges and solutions. And I guess to go back to the, the, the full panel, you all come at this from a very different perspective, but I'd like to hear from you what your biggest challenge along the way was. Well, I think, I, th I think for, for almost everyone who's been running a business in the last five years, the biggest challenge that they probably faced was 2008. Um, it, it's, it's, it's sort of easy to laugh about that now, but the, it really was a time when people in, in the business community, and particularly in the, the sort of new business community, people who were trying to start businesses and trying to launch businesses, uh, every single bank basically didn't want to talk to you. Um, all the equity and venture investors were sitting on the sidelines waiting for uh, some clearer sense of when the crisis would be over. Um, customers weren't buying anything. It was really a time where you could, you could either say, wow, let's close up shop, or we're going to be stronger if we make it through this. And uh, at General Compression, I, th I think it was, it was very difficult. We had to lay off about uh, half of the people in the company. Um, but we, we innovated our technology even further. We used the, the difficulty and adversity as a way to kind of refine and improve what our company was doing and what, what our technology and what our product was, uh, what our solution was going to deliver to the market. And, and we came out better because of it. Uh, but there were times, I think, when when I was the only person in the company who thought we were going to make it through. And uh, uh, um, that was, I think, that, you know, the tough times of, of, it makes other tough times look small by comparison, I think. So I'm going to answer that a couple of ways. Um, certainly the uncertainty that came from the 2008 economic recession and the current environment that we're facing uh, in, in renewable energy right now makes it very, very difficult to plan for a business, particularly when you're a manufacturer, and to figure out where you're going and how to, how to outfit your, your facility and make sure that you can do what you need to do. Um, on a more general basis, I, I would actually say that people are the biggest challenge, and I say that very fondly. Um, because, of course, your employees and your people are your, are your greatest asset, and, and I think the, the most satisfaction from running a business comes from people, but they're, they're, it's a big challenge all the way through the business life cycle. If you think about a company when it's brand new uh, or an, as an employer, you don't know how to recruit people and hire people and train people, and you have to learn that. And then as a company gets going, and if you're, you're ramping up like, like we did pr prior to 2008, um, you just need more and more people, and you, you hire like crazy. There was a period of time in our company when we were growing anywhere from 50 to 80 percent per year. And, and I remember talking to the employees and saying, do you realize that over half of our, the people here have been with the company less than one year? That's extremely challenging because people don't know each other, and, and you don't know what what you've got in terms of talent and people are, are, are not completely trained and it's very challenging. And then when you reach a, a place where we're at now where growth is not happening because of all the challenges in the industry, then you've got that pile of people um, employed with you who want to see their careers grow and, and want to stay employed and, and you've got to make sure that, that, that they stay the morale stays up and that they're in the right place. And um, so it continues. I think regardless of where you are as a company, that's always a challenge that management has to rise to and, and, and figure out how to, to do well at. Now, the challenge that I see in the renewables for us is that hydro represents 7% of the power generated in the US. 
and yet nobody ever thinks about it. We, we take hydro for granted, and there's a lot of opportunity left in hydro. So for, first of all, is just getting it on the agenda. We talk a lot about wind, we talk a lot about solar, biomass, but hydro seems to be a hidden subject, and yet it's one of the, what is the biggest renewable out there, and it's got probably the most potential. So the potential is the second challenge. The biggest thing getting in our way of building more hydro is not dams, it's not uh, water, it's really the licensing process. If you have an idea today to, to build a, a hydro installation, it will be five to ten years before you even get a license. And there's a big upfront cost to building a hydro project, and it's difficult for the investors to really make the business model make sense when there's so much uncertainty in the licensing process. So one of the biggest wishes we would have is that the licensing process still fully vets the, the new installations, takes the time to, to go through the process, but that really can get it done in a certain timeline. So that is our biggest challenge to building more hydro. Um, I think for us as a small company and, and just all, you know, growing in the solar industry has um, been our customers. A lack of education. Lack of education has been one of the major um, hurdles that we have um, encountered. Many times when um, our sales force is going out, we're not going out necessarily to make a sale on the product, but it's to really truly educate uh, the end user, the consumer, the customer. And we find a lot of times to be there at um, great, great length, um, explaining to the customer not only the economic um, benefits, but the environmental benefits. We're trying to be you know, progressive about um, making sure that our customers understand that it is a win-win situation. So that has been one of the major challenges that we've had, that um, our customers are not truly understanding um, what they're um, really truly getting into, even though they want it. Um, another challenge that we have encountered is that um, with solar being so um, such the hot topic um, with renewable energy, we're finding more and more solar companies evolving on a daily basis. And so they too sometimes are not properly trained in certain situations that might arise. And so we find ourselves going out and correcting issues and one of the correction of those issues are then re-winning customers back over again to try to regain their um, trust in solar um, because it's an abstract thing right now for us, uh, the, the laymen, if you want to say, for those who truly are not in it every day. So um, we, we are uh, having a, a twofold uh, struggle. But at the end of the day, we stay in it and we continue the process and we just uh, continue to move forward in, in the education piece. Yeah, I'm about a year old here as a company, Zam Energy, and so in the startup mode, there's always interesting things to, to push forward, but just like Vernice is saying, we're looking at disbelief. People are saying, you mean, isn't this too expensive? I, I just don't think we can afford it. Well, no, solar has come to a point where in some states it's considered grid parity, meaning it's about the same price as um, bringing gas in. So that's first. But secondly, people just don't think, well, why would I put solar on a parking lot? And then there's also some of the big hurdles that I look at is, wow, well, there's infrastructure costs that seem expensive. Well, we have that solved. We've figured out this is a business model that makes money for, from day one for everybody involved. And I get a lot of raised eyebrows. They don't understand how we can do it. It doesn't, that's not what's being said out there. We can do it. And it's, um, we're taking, where I'm putting um, my market sector is specifically in civic centers large government facilities, we're looking at campuses, uh, universities, airports, stadiums, infrastructure where sustainable transportation and infrastructure where we can finance this from a long-term perspective and it's a win-win that you have said as well. 
So we heard uh, when it comes to challenges um, from this end of the table, 2008 was a significant challenge. The uncertainty with respect to the marketplace um, is having an impact on your bottom line. When you, Jan, look out at the future and think about renewable power, where do you see it going? What do you think the future potential for renewables is in this country? Well, I guess I'd actually rephrase the question a little bit and say that the future is renewable energy. Um, <laughs> and it's a matter of how fast we're going to get there. You know, what, what, are, what are we going to do as a, as a nation and as, as a world to deploy it in a greater scale and, and get there quickly? And, and are we going to be aggressive about it? Or are we going to limp along? Um, you know, what are we going to do to invest in, in transmission and research, research costs that are closer to commercialization and all the things that are needed to, to take the technology that's out there and, and really bring it um, to the fore? So you know, it's clear to me that, that with climate change, with energy security, with the limited supply of fossil fuels, it is our future. And it will be happening. It's just a matter of when. Great. So you touched on a subject um, that the administration has invested in heavily, that's research and development for clean energy. And I wonder, Eric, if you could speak to the fact ARPA-E was created in, in 2009, modeled after DARPA, the Defense Advanced Projects Ener Energy. And the goal is to fund um, early stage transformational research and development. I wondered if you could speak to how ARPA-E's investment has been critical to your success. Sure. So our company is creating large-scale grid-connected energy storage technology. And uh, to do that, we have to develop uh, the com so we're, that, that works by compressing air into underground caverns and then uh, expanding the air when energy is needed on the grid. And this system that we're designing is designed to operate. It's a modular system. It's designed to operate to be able to built into very large projects, so hundreds or p potentially even thousands of megawatts in size. But the, the process of developing that, that, that hardware that we need um, is, is not a short process. And uh, we, had we had successfully raised some funding, and that funding had allowed us to demonstrate at a very uh, modest scale that, that the science behind what we were doing was going to work. So, um, and, and, and our technology has quite a lot to do with thermodynamics and, and heat transfer. And I know that when Arun was looking at our proposal, he was wondering whether it would really work, because um, uh, he has a, a, a background in, in thermal sciences. Um, and the fact that we've been able to demonstrate a small uh, scale machine actually made ARPA-E confident. Um, we, we had not been able to get our story, uh, we had not been able to advance the technology story to uh, larger scale investors um, because there was risk and because there was some early stage technology development still to do. Um, what, what was amazing about ARPA-E's role in this is that because they, ha they had selected people who really had expertise in the area that we were working in, those people could come in and instead of sort of staring at us blankly when we talked about you know, isothermal compression and various other uh, technical terms, they said, yeah, tell us more about that. Yeah, how are you doing that? Let's see, let's see where the risks are. And that collaboration actually created a, a plan to take us through the demonstration of the, of the, the key aspects um, that needed still to be demonstrated. And uh, once we accomplished that, it, it really had a very beneficial effect on our ability to raise money. And, uh, and since we've accomplished the, uh, that, that ARPA-E program, it's, it's almost like a, uh, it's, it's, it's like this, the kind of the success story for ARPA-E because they put $700,000 to work with us. We accomplished that in a very short period of time, less than six months. And after that, we've raised over $60 million. So that is an example of where uh, a very educated and skilled technical team with, with risk capital, government risk capital to invest, can make a, uh, a very big difference in the trajectory of a company that's bringing a desperately needed solution to market. 
So obviously innovation was key to your success, but I, I've also learned in, in my interactions with the renewable energy sector that innovation comes in many different ways. And I was hoping maybe the rest of the panel could talk to, you know, what makes your work in renewable energy innovative? Well, my work and our work at Voith in, in hydro energy, we're innovating through the fact that there's 3% of the dams out there there's 80,000 dams in the U.S. and only 3% of them produce power. We're trying to innovate by putting, harnessing the power that's running through these dams every day. So we see tons of potential. There's innovation where one of the issues could be, hey, what, what about the fish? Well, now we have turbines. We've innovated the technology that the turbines will pass the fish right through without harming the fish. So there's potential for fish friendly, uh, more energy, and, and it's abundant, it's all around us. We just need to harness it. Thanks for the softball. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're really excited about one of the technologies, solar trees. Solar trees are solar carports. You can put them out and create groves. Envision, uh, Envision Solar in San Diego manufactures them, and they track the sun. Now, you can embed those with intelligence, which is uh, something that we're working on uh, through the SBIR phase two grant with the Department of Energy. And we're very excited about some innovations that we're gonna be creating smart grid aware intelligence that we're gonna be integrating in on the EVSE, which is the um, electric vehicle charging equipment area. And uh, we expect that these are the types of innovations that are going to pay big dividends because we, ex we expect to export these as well. Um, I think for us, because we've been around for about 28 years plus, um, I'd hate to use the word guinea pigs, but um, many times we are commissioned by manufacturers to use their products and materials and give back insight as to um, how it works. Um, is, it, is it beneficial for the consumer? Is it beneficial for um, installers once they begin to put it on the market? So we are able to remain on the cutting edge in the sense that um, we're, able, we're the first to be able to use many of the products that are developed and created and make sure that they are um, uh, usable, that they are going to be um, uh, stand worthy, they're gonna wor you know, stand up to, to the name, um, making sure that um, they're going to um, produce and um, provide what um, manufacturers are saying that they're going to do. So we're, we're able to be a part of that. We're, we're at the jumping edge with many of the manufacturers um, before the products even hit the line. So it's really exciting to be on that end with them. So on the, on the notion of usability, I, I have a question for you, Erin. Um, your company, Zam, uh, Zam Energy, is planning to help hospitals, cities, community neighborhoods by redesigning parking spaces to become clean energy centers. What advice would you offer to students and community members who want to urge their high schools, colleges, and community centers to get on board with renewable energy? Excellent choice. Well, I have to say, it, when I was in college, I, I don't think I could afford gas for a car today. There's, and so um, why not talk to uh, colleges about having a fleet of loaners that are electrified? And why not think about um, talking to community leaders as well on putting infrastructure in place in the cities that will allow people to also have loaners and fleets and of uh, electrified vehicles because it's 60% um, less to do that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so just switching Switching topics for just a minute. Kevin, going back to something you said earlier, we talked about the great potential for hydropower, um, and everybody here has great potential. Um, what, from your perspective, you know, how can we best utilize America's natural resources to produce hydropower? Oh, thank you. I mentioned the fact that there's 80,000 dams out there. Think what we could do if we started to harness this potential that we're allowing water to pass over and, and not getting energy of right now. You start thinking about a couple of the major initiatives as to how can we produce jobs, how can we create jobs in this country. As we get out to, to harness some of this energy that's sitting there not being harnessed now, uh, we can put people to work. We, we think the Department of Energy has looked at 
at uh, 12 megawatts or 12 gigawatts of power that is out there unharnessed. Another study in 2009 said the same, same thing, that hydro has tons of opportunity. That same study said that we could put 1.4 million more Americans to work if we just started tapping into these dams. So we can do it. We have fish-friendly turbines, so we don't have to harm the environment. It's clean, it's baseload. We can produce power that is reliable so that it doesn't uh, come on and off. It's, it's dispatchable when we need it. So we think it's very important for the country. We think that we can employ Americans and we think we can be good for the environment. Great. Um, and I think as we're beginning to wrap up here, I just want to pose one last question to everybody. We've heard about everything from um, clean energy parking lots to energy storage and, and hydro and solar. Um, as anybody in the audience or for those listening, what words of wisdom would you give to other individuals and companies trying to develop a breakthrough in renewable energy? We'll start at this end. Well, the breakthroughs in renewable energy are going to have to really be through a lot of work on innovating from a perspective of w look out two, three, four years ahead and always maintain that vision and have a picture in your mind of what is going to be a sustainable business model and try to innovate at least ahead of that. For me, I would say stay encouraged. Uh, continue to put one foot in front of the other and you will finally reach that destination. I'm going to steal Mr. Nellen's story. He started out at the back of his vehicle um, 28 years ago um, where they made fun of him and said, oh, no, this is impossible. You're not going to be able to last. And here I stand today as his predecessor um, to continue the, the process to grow this company to the next level. So stay encouraged. Don't get um, uh, swayed away from your dreams and your desires. Aim for the moon and you will land amongst the stars. Um, it is a bright future, and um, this industry has yet to scratch the surface. Just a few words. <laughs> I have to say that this job is not easy. Creating opportunities out of what's there around us every day is not easy. So it's hard work, it's persistence, and it's really finding potential in the challenges that are out there. So it's never looking at it as a problem, but only as an opportunity. Um, so in answering this, this question, I want to first make sure that everybody knows what my company does. I don't think I've said that yet. Um, we're a manufacturer of wind resource and now solar resource uh, assessment qu equipment for the renewable energy industry. And we also make uh, turbine control sensors and products for uh, health monitoring of, of wind turbines that are out there. So our, our innovation comes in developing the right products at the right time for our customers. If, if you stick to the resource assessment side, they're going to buy our equipment, put it out there in the field, look at a particular site and see if the resource potential is there and then take that data and have it analyzed uh, and, and talk to a, a banker or a financier and say that this, this is a good site, it's a good investment to, uh, to make. So that's what we do. So our innovation comes in making sure that our customers have what they need at the right time. And when you talk about innovation and, and breakthrough, I, I think it's really important to recognize that we have viable solutions, at least in wind energy today. You know, it's a viable, cost-competitive solution, uh, energy source that's out there. And what we really need to do is innovate to make that more widespread and, and deploy it more, more rapidly. Um, so I think that's, that's really important. And those, those breakthroughs can come in any area. They could be not just in product, but they can come in permitting. Um, they can come in project finance. They can come um, in policy, and, and, and as well as engineering. And I think that's really important to know that this innovation and this and, and getting this this industry forward isn't going to involve a lot of different types of people and a lot of different types of innovation. Um, I, I think there's a couple different levels to answer the question on. Um, one is sort of you answered very well, which is sort of where are all the areas that need innovation. Um, innovating is hard because you have to believe in your idea absolutely and you have to change it frequently. So um, that takes a certain kind of, you know, if that's discouraging, for example, you better work on that before you try to start a company that's based on innovating. 
Um, so that's really, it's, I think it's, it's really important to develop some of the personal and, and even psychological resources that are necessary to be an innovator. Um, the famous story about Edison, I forget how many thousand light bulbs he tried before he got it right. I could probably tell you the same sort of story uh, with our technology, and we're still innovating it. So um, I think that's important. But the, the, the other piece is sort of the mark. So that's the where do the ideas come from, and, and how do you keep going? The other piece is what do you look at in the market? And I, I think if you want to be an innovator in clean energy, you cannot rely on the government to support the clean energy sector. The government is doing a good job trying to do that, but it is we, we cannot rely on that always being there. And if you start a business that relies on that, you're putting your own wealth and your investors' wealth at risk. And so you need to, I think that the key innovation that we need to make now is, is move the renewable energy sector into the mainstream of the U.S. power uh, business. And I think we're seeing that with the cost curves on solar. I think we're seeing that with the cost curves on wind. We're seeing that with the ability of um, resource assessment companies to be able to provide really, really uh, excellent forecasts and, and, and uh, bankable, essentially, resource assessments. Um, but the, the, the key thing that we have to do is push the, the renewable energy sector away from depending on um, policy supports and into the becoming a mainstream competitor. And part of that is looking for application areas like the military and other places where they have much higher implicit price of energy. And other things are reducing costs, um, business model innovations. It's all part of it. But I think that has to be our, you know, we're not, we're not going to be successful unless we do that. And, and so that's what, you know, that's job one in my book. Great. Well, um, I'm, I, I see our next speaker is here, so I want to thank all of our panelists and, um, and move it along to Rohan. Thanks so much, Heather, and thanks to our second panel. Um, I just wanted to point out, uh, for those of you that uh, have access to the Internet, which is pretty much everyone, uh, you can find bios about the champions uh, and blogs that they've done about their companies and about their experience uh, at whitehouse.gov slash champions. Uh, there's, there's blogs there, and, and, and if you want to relive the memories of this uh, fantastic event, uh, feel free to go to the White House YouTube site, and uh, the entirety of the event will be, will be played there. Um, to close out uh, our, our fantastic event here today, I want to introduce uh, the director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, um, Dr. John Holdren. And Dr. Holdren was previously a professor uh, of environmental policy at the Kennedy School at Harvard, uh, where he taught at the public policy program at the school's Belfour Center for Science and International Affairs and was the director of the Woods Hole Research. Dr. Holdren truly is uh, one of the foremost scientists uh, in the world. Dr. Holdren. Well, thank you very much, Rohan. It's uh, great to be here with you in the White House. Uh, great to be with this terrific group of champions of change that we're celebrating today. And it's great to have that celebration be the magnet that has brought together everybody in this room from inside and outside the government to talk about the crucial topic of more efficient, more sustainable, more reliable energy supply, storage, and conversion. This domain is obviously one of the cornerstones of an economy built to last, as the President keeps emphasizing. And let me start by saying that we are fortunate indeed to have in President Obama a leader who understands with such crystal clarity how and why science, engineering, and innovation matter. Matter for the future of our country, for our energy future, of course, but also for our economy more broadly, for our health, our environment, our security, and indeed for the sense of wonder and optimism that comes from discovery and invention and exploration of new frontiers. A key insight about how all of this works, about how discovery and invention and innovation lead to improved and new processes and products and services, new businesses and good jobs, big improvements in people's lives, relates to the growing importance of partnerships of a wide variety of kinds. 
President Obama has pointed out repeatedly that our challenges and opportunities are so big and the resources available for meeting them are so limited that we simply can't afford not to partner. This is one of the things he means when he says we need all hands on deck. We need to foment stronger partnerships among federal departments and agencies, between the administration and the Congress, between federal and state and local levels of government, among the public and private and philanthropic sectors, between the civil and military sectors, and indeed in the appropriate domains among nations. Of course, there are some who say, when they contemplate the roles of the different players in these partnerships, that the federal government is trying to do too much and needs to retrench. Well, I stand with President Obama in insisting that the government's investments in basic and early stage applied research, in transportation and information and energy infrastructure, and in science, technology, engineering, and math education are not the places to cut back. These investments are our seed corn. They are the foundation for a prosperous, healthy, secure, and environmentally sustainable future for all Americans. The private sector will be the engine that drives much of the expansion of American prosperity that we all desire. But there are so many ways that the government can catalyze, enable, and help along the advances that the private sector will propagate. I've mentioned basic and early stage applied research and infrastructure and support for strength in science, technology, engineering, and math education. But there's also the government's role in creating a policy and economic environment in which entrepreneurship and risk taking can flourish, where capital is available, intellectual property rights are protected, and talented scientists and engineers from other countries can get into this country for stays short, long, and permanent. And there's a role for government as well in procurements for defense and other public purposes that allow technologies that will eventually be important in the civil sector to come to maturity and to fall in cost. Many products that we depend on today were developed thanks to critical government investments and indeed procurement. Jet aircraft, the internet, satellite global positioning systems, fire resistant clothing, and a great deal more. You could all add to this list, I know. Similarly, many of the projects that have been described here today by our champions of change have been successful thanks in part to critical government investments or encouragement of other kinds. The trick, obviously, is to bring the right blend of solid scientific and engineering knowledge and creative risk-taking together to ensure that we capture the best ideas and that they come to fruition. And that is what we are committed to promoting in this White House and in this administration. I hope you come away from the discussions that have taken place today with a better appreciation for the range of roles that the federal government has in spurring innovation in partnership with so many other entities and sectors. It's difficult, of course. Innovation is always difficult. And the road from inspiration to invention and widespread application is often a twisty and bumpy one. And it's one in which you may find yourself making up the map as you go along. The champions of change that we're celebrating here today have done that. They've made their own maps. And they've followed them to success in energy innovation. On behalf of President Obama, as well as myself and all the folks who work on science, technology, and innovation in this administration, I salute you, you champions of change. I thank you. And I have only two asks. One, that you keep up the good work. And the other is that you strive to be the role models that you can and should be in inspiring others to innovate and achieve as you have done. Thank you very much. Thanks again to our audience for being here, uh, to all of our military leadership that, that was able to be here, and, and congrats uh, once again to our champions. Uh, thanks so much.